Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Soul Food Coffee House. Welcome to Soul Food Poetry Night. I'm Michael Dillon Welch, and I'm very pleased you've made the choice to join us here tonight. There are always many choices in life, and you've made the best one, I think. So, welcome. Who's here for the first time at Poetry Night? Wow, a lot of you. Welcome. And if you're a first time reader, mention that when you get up here, and we'll give you an extra cheer during our open mic. If you haven't yet signed up for our open mic reading, the sign-up sheet is right down here. And we have a question of the month each time. And tonight's question, courtesy of Azim, is what is your favorite wild animal? And I'll tell you more about Azim in a moment. What is your favorite wild animal? And we promise not to psychoanalyze it. One thing I'd like to mention is our next Soul Food Poetry Night is coming up um, on April 20. Is that right? April 20, featuring uh, poets who are published by Two Sylvia's Press. And that includes Janine Hall Gailey, Natasha Moni, Michael Schmelzer, and Molly Tenenbaum. And I think Molly is bringing her banjo, too. So that should be fun. Coming up uh, April 20, Two Sylvia's Press. To get us started tonight, I wanted to read a poem by another poet who's uh, come to this stage. It's Roberto Ascalon, and this is his poem, Cradle. When I donate blood, I always ask the technician if I can hold the bag afterwards. What does one quart of me feel like? I want to know. They never let me. It is against regulations to hold yourself in that way. <laughs> we have a great privilege tonight to hear various contributors to Raven Chronicles. And I'm very grateful for Phoebe Boucher, who's uh, helped set this up. And uh, she's assembled a fine cast of characters for us tonight. And although this is usually Soul Food Poetry Night, tonight, because we're featuring the journal, we have a mix of uh, fiction, poetry, graphic novels, and I think some surprises or two. And one of the surprises is coming up first. And it uh, may be our youngest reader ever in this series. I don't know. So our first uh, readers... Our first reader is uh, Maliha Masood, who is a writer, mother, and teacher. She was born in Pakistan and immigrated to the United States in 1982 at the age of 11 and grew up in Bellevue. She is the author of two travel memoirs, Zatar Days, Henna Nights, Adventures, Dreams, and Destinations Across the Middle East, and Dizzy in Karachi, A, journal, a Journey to Pakistan. Her work has been featured on NPR and PBS, and she will be reading tonight with her son, Azim, who is a second grader at Shelton View Elementary in Bothell. Azim is eight years old, and his interests include snap circuits, and if you don't know what that is, you probably feel old like I do. He loves chapter books, King County Public Libraries, let's hear it for libraries, And he also loves shopping for expensive Lego sets on Amazon. <laughs> and I just saw some Lego at Costco this week, so I hadn't seen them there before. So you can check that, that out too, not just Amazon. So I'm very pleased that they're going to be reading together. So please welcome Maliha and Azim. Hi everyone, thank you very, very much for being here. This is um, quite an event for me. It's been about five years since I did another reading and um, it's very different from most of my other work as you're about to find out. 
Um, I like to do experiments and also encourage people to understand what writing is all about. And for me, much of writing is communication. It really is an art. And um, if I weren't able to have an audience and a readership, um, there's just no point to it. And I wanted to pass this lesson on to my son, who is my muse and inspiration. So here we go. Are you ready? Okay. Just... Who is Zeus's grandfather? Uranus. Ding, ding, ding. He gobbles up the strawberry, barely looking at the fruit as I feed it to him. Who is Zeus's dad? Kronos. Yep. I pierce the berry with the fork and offer it to him again. Who is Zeus's grandmother? Gia. Bingo. His mouth opens wide for another helping as he studies the family tree diagram that is the source of endless fascination and horrific meltdowns. Okay, I know you won't get this one. Shoot. Huh? Never mind. Just go ahead, ask the question. And this is the last one, okay? It's almost bedtime. Fast enough. He waves me off as I'm a pesky fly. I paint his lips with the fruit's juicy underside, and he takes it. Who was Artemis' mom? Hera? Nope. Aphrodite? Wrong again. He chews and he smiles. I try handing him the fork strawberry one more time, but he ignores it and implores me to continue serving it to him. It takes every ounce of my patience to continue this charade. Is it Leto? Correct. So what if he's a seven-year-old walking encyclopedia on Greek mythology, yet can't even eat his own fruit for dessert? Not that I expect Azim to eat the strawberries whole with his fingers, like I've seen other kids do since preschool. That would be a major accomplishment. We're simply not there yet. What soldier's name is from the Trojan War and is also from the capital of a country in Europe? Paris. Yes. I jab the slippery strawberry into the fork and slip it back into his mouth while he continues to fixate on his book. If only he would drink smoothies. Oh, a mother can dream. Who fell in love with Orpheus? Echo? Nope. Athena? Try again. I need a clue. Her name starts with an E. Hmm. Eurydice? Bingo. And we're finally down to the last strawberry of the night. Who is Pan's father? No idea. Ha ha. Game over. Eat this. No. He clamps his lips closed and pulls, pushes the fork away. I draw it closer to his face. I'm full. Oh, come on. Just one more. Nope. Please? No. Okay, fine. One last question, and that's it. We're closing this topic. Understood? Thank you very much. He flips through a few more pages and stops short. Who is the muse of comedy? Oh, yeah. You're right. Okay, we're going to stop here. So the essay is entitled um, Chaos on Mount Olympus, and I wrote it last summer. Um, after we have finished um, homeschooling, most of Azim's first grade curriculum basically revolved around the subject of mythology. We got into, um, we did some Roman, a little bit of Norse, and some Egyptian, but the Greeks sort of captured his imagination. And also, what else did you do? Constellations? Yeah. Yeah? Do you want to talk a little bit about constellations? Huh? What, yeah. What's the connection between constellations and the Greeks? Well, the Greeks sort of referred to constellations as, as characters in their mythology. Like, Leo the lion is actually the Nemean lion, a monster in Greek mythology. That's right. So we've moved on to some other interests, and right now our special interest is what is the... Scratch. So Scratch is his newest fixation. It's um, programming language um, created by MIT and 
they teach it in schools now as young as second grade, and it's sort of replaced mythology as our fixation or obsession of the day. Okay, come on, come on, let's finish. So I'm just gonna close with this scene and um, finish up, okay? So picture this glorious late afternoon in July. Sunbeam stands across the dining room, where Azim sits in the tall wooden chair with his legs folded, crisscross applesauce. He grasps his favorite charcoal pencil in his right hand and flips his sketchbook open to a clean white page that will soon be mapped out with an intricate flow chart that is practically hardwired in his psyche. Where's Hades? I need my book on Hades. It has the best family tree diagram. But you have 10 other books. I don't know where the Hades book is right now, okay? I'll find it later. But I need it now, otherwise I can't do my tree. I don't know where it is. We have so much stuff checked out from the library. It must have gotten lost somewhere. I need the Hades book, otherwise I'll have the biggest meltdown and all the neighbors will hear it. <laughs> I said I'll look for it later. I have to make dinner. Dad's coming home. I need it now. Oh, dear. Danger alert. Red-faced seven-year-old with squirming body and high-pitched voice. Thanks a lot, Hades, god of the underworld. It's all your fault, you loathsome doomsday goon. You have taken my son captive, and I have to do my motherly duty and bail him out. Thank you. You've been a great audience. Well, I think that's a first for Soul Food Poetry Night. Thank you once again. Uh, our next reader is Robert Francis Bloor, who was raised in Seattle's central area in Rainier Valley. It, several of his poems have been published in anthologies, Voices of the Asian American Experience from the University of Santa Cruz, and Where Are You From? Uh, the famous book project in Oregon. His chapbook, Alas Alascaro Memories, Alascaro Memories, was published by Carrion Press. It's it's my eyesight, not not the not the word that I was stumbling over. At least that's what I'm going to blame. Yes. Um, so please welcome Robert Francis Blfloor. Well, thank you very much to Soul Food Cafe and to uh, Raven Chronicles. And Anna and Phoebe for inviting me to read uh, from my um, chapbook, which was published this past fall, I'll Ask Girl Memories. Um, it's a book, um, a chapbook about my uh, experiences uh, in the early 1960s when I was in college and would spend the summers in an Alaska cannery, uh, King Cove, which is on the very tip of the Alaska Peninsula. Um, so I'm going to read a few poems from that. They're mostly relatively short. Um, before I read them, I wanted to um, give you a little bit of an uh, envelope about um, how these men got here, uh, the Manongs or the uncles who were the first immigrants uh, from the Philippines. They came mostly in the 1920s and 30s, um, and I had the pleasure of working with them for for four summers. Um, but one of the questions that always uh, people I know that I talk with don't know a lot about Philippine American history and why did America come to the Philippines in the first place? Um, and America acquired the Philippines in uh, 1898 from Spain following the Spanish American War and they bought it um, in, from Spain in the 20, Treaty of Paris in 1920, and uh, subsequently, the Filipinos had already 
just about throwing the Spanish out and thought they were going to be self-government, found themselves owned by the Americas. But it really, the reason America came to the Philippines was we talk about manifest destiny and wanting to go out and over, like overthrow the kingdom of Hawaii. And, uh, but America, Theodore Roosevelt in particular, who had been the assistant secretary of Navy at the time, wanted a naval base to compete with what he saw uh, the other colonial powers having, uh, Britain and Hong Kong and French and Vietnam and or Indochina at the time and that kind of thing. So that was one of the reasons they came. And then subsequently, because it was American territory for 46 years, um, it allowed Filipinos to come to become part of the labor force when the Chinese and Japanese were um, uh, uh, faced the um, the Gentlemen's Agreement and then the Chinese Exclusion Act. So they were, they lost that labor force, so they needed another one. So the Hawaiian uh, sugar plantations went out and got cicadas for Filipinos to come and do that. And subsequently, these men came and they would uh, work the California fields, uh, doing all the agricultural uh, picking, the asparagus and so on. And then in the summers, but early spring, they would come up and go up to Alaska and uh, work the salmon counties. So um, the book uh, is really about, uh, it's a tribute to them because I wouldn't have finished college probably financially without a lot of their help. Um, I was, my father had come in 1932 from the Philippines and so um, I knew a lot of the men in the families because we all kind of grew up in the central area of the city. So one of the first uh, poems I'm going to read is The Alaska Union, which was Local 37. It was located down on 2nd and Washington. <clears throat> Alaska Union, Seattle, 1960s. Warm weather in April and May beckons waves of Filipinos north from Stockton, Salinas, and Watsonville, washing Seattle shores. Sun companions them. They inhabit Chinatown hotels gamble underground dens, shoot nine ball, loiter Second Avenue outside Local 37, wait, wish, and hope. Hope for assignments as sorters, butchers, slimers, fillers, or catch and can. Hope once again for an Alaska town, Falls Pass, Naknek, Bristol Bay, Chignik, or Carlip. Hope for a cannery with kings, reds, humpies, dogs, and silvers, their migrant brothers and so sisters. A compadre reunion, names float the air, past lips, Abaya, Torres, Navarro, Adayag. No longer young, some no longer uh, able, dreams deferred, dreams suppressed. Unseen money changes hands under the table to pass a health check, a way of life, their journey receding. So that was, I was very young, it was uh, probably 1920 uh, when, I, when I was going up there. And it was a group of us that they called the young boys there. All of us had grown up in the central area in Rainier Valley. And so we went up to this uh, couple of particular canneries in King Cove and Falls Pass for the two closest ones. Um, the, the book also has a little a thread of a love story in it. I, uh, kind of holds the book together a little bit. Um, so this one's called Boeing Field, 1963. A summer evening, my folks drive us to Boeing Field. Linda and I silently cuddle in the back seat. My first time to the canneries. Mahogany men cram the airport. Hard, brown, Pinoy faces rim the waiting area. Young boys, like me, cluster in close uncertainty. I squeeze her picture tight against my chest. In my duffel, the four tops and righteous brothers. We hug goodbyes before I board for Cold Bay. A final kiss, I cross the tarmac, fly north. Becoming a last We depart Boeing Field, wedged among the Manong migrants, blown north to canned salmon their summer hiatus from asparagus fields and almond orchards. 
our revolution circles, cold bays, fog-laced clutch of corrugated huts, nestled on grizzled ground and subterrain. We descend into our frigid cloud breasts, huddled in warm pool hall. Like netted fish, we wait a tender bound for King Cove. Another thread in, in the book is uh, about the canning process. We, you know, when we eat things at our table or we go to the stores, we kind of take for granted uh, and we don't think much about how the food got there or what the process was, what the people endured to get it there, whether they harvested. I, I don't know if you know how to pick asparagus, but it's backbreaking. You're in the 100 degree heat all day and you're bent over digging out of the ground and that kind of thing. So it's, it's tough. And, uh, can, and salmon canneries work, you would often work probably an average of 12, 13, 14 hours a day over fish, oftentimes all frozen. So your hands would be really awful at the end of the day. And then you might work around the clock doing other jobs. Uh, actually, in that time, I learned to do just about every job in the cannery. So this has a little thread of the the canning process and what it takes to get a salmon can to your table. 5.30 a.m., King Cove. Mr. Asina, our foreman, sports of the Carol Stetson and Mackinac, traipses the hallway, calls to each room. Get up, boys, get up, time to go. Breakfast, cookie prepares ham, eggs, and hot makala kasai, colorful coffee word. Mr. Asina orders, boys, you go slime. We don rubber boots, suits and boots, waddle to stations. Butchers straddle the iron shank, separating salmon heads and tails. Slimers gauntlet the tables, gutting the remains. Blood money, hard work. And the iron shank was a machine that was designed in 1903 by E.A. Smith, and it was to replace the Chinese workers, so they're for the derogatory name. Uh, for the machine, but it could do, at that time, about 3,000 fish in about an hour or so. So, and it's, it's something you didn't want to stick your hand in because it would take your hand with it. Um, the fish house. Willie, the head butcher, pulls the pneumatic lever of an overhanging bin. Falling fish cascade the counter like festive shoppers. He whirls and twirls sockeyes, silvers, and humpies drawing tables, spinning their bodies, straightening their heads for the guillotine. Decapitated salmon dance the conveyor, chain conveyor through a circle of knives, spinning, twisting, and pirouetting blades, guts, spins, and entrails sheer away. Carcasses tumble to the cutting tables. I admire Willie for the hard, hour he, hard hours he works till the carving's complete. One day, he says, you try. So I got up and tried, and the first thing I did was open the bin, which is gravity, it's a gravity flow with hundreds of fish, and it just all came out on the table all over the place. It's, a, it's quite a mess. A um, couple more, and that'll be it, I think. Um, there were a number of women that worked in the canneries, mostly Aleut native women, um, uh, and they would do a lot of the jobs during the canneries. They'd do the sliming. It also work as patchers, and patchers is when the cans are coming down, they'll go to one side or the other on the on the catching can line, and they either pull the can out or they they weigh the cans and they uh, make it so it's a, the right weight for closing and that kind of thing. So patchers. Edna scurries the boardwalk from shanty to catching can. She mustn't be late. Joins other surgically clouded, shrouded alley women straddling the conveyor line. With gloved hands, they grasp tongs and small scalpels, scrutinizing salmon cans rattling past. Patches weigh and adjust the canisters, adding or subtract, subtracting fish scraps. Triage caskets continuing along the cascade of the catching can to steaming retorts. Shift ended, Edna struggles home from sh uh, station to shanty. Late, a cold wind falls. Um, this will be my last poem. I won't tell you how the romance ended. Uh, you'll have to buy the book. Okay. Um, there is a uh, triptych on the uh, north end of Beacon Hill 
that was created by Valeriano Ligo. And in the 1960s, uh, he was the probably the only Filipino poet or a painter, uh, and he was teaching at Xiaoliu. But he uh, later, uh, a few years later, created this triptych. Um, it's right by where PacMed, the old Amazon Rain Hospital is, in what's called Rizal Park. And I was his last, uh, before he passed away, I was his last student. And uh, well, obviously not a good artist, so I never, never uh, succeeded in that field. So, LIGO's East-West Triptych. Mahogany artist of mahogany men fashions, ha fashions homage to Filipinos who crossed an ocean of dreams, articulated with alascaros, cicadas, waders, asparagus and hop pickers, nurses, pensionados, barbers, and boxers. Accented with gambling dens, cockfights, dime dances, brothels, and bunkhouses, affixed with in-laws and outlaws of the Spanish cross and Moorish moon. Hearts in search of America, Pinoy's arrived, with Tamaran Carabao memories, silent servants apprenticed in this new Eden, melting into the melting pot, yet clinging to an adobo past, they came. Your east-west star celebrates their memory and yours. So that's it. So, thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Phoebe, could I have you come up here for a bit and tell us more about Raven Chronicles and some of the publications you have available? Uh, we just started publishing books. This is after we, we started in 1991 in Seattle. We've been published since 1991. And uh, Multicultural Magazine and um, this is the first time um, that we are switched to a book format. So this is our first book, and it's a, it's a tribute to the Jack Star Writers Program, which is a great program. And this is 25, celebrating 25 years of Jack Star Writers there. Has anybody heard of Jack Star Writers here? <laughs> yeah. And so it's a great program, and we, um, all the curators, 20 curators, oh, it's 20 years, sorry, they pick two writers out of their each year of their program, and we publish work by each, two writers and the 20 curators, and it's a great group like Rebecca Brown and uh, Charles Mugabe, and I mean, just really good group of writers, and that was our first journal, but before that, we published this, which is our first book, Word from the Cafe and Anthology, and uh, Anna Ballant, who's coming up next to read, she was the editor, and it's a great book. And it also has a CD of the 10 featured writers in the back. And these are uh, people that Anna teaches at the Recovery Cafe, which is in downtown Seattle. And this book has really gotten great blurbs, and it's selling well <laughs> on Amazon. And we're going to do a program at the University of Washington in the nursing department, the social services department. And this is going to be featured with the one book by a nurse there. So anyway, so I, I think we're doing a pretty good job with our first book. So our, we have a, our next issue is the theme is home, and I have some submission guidelines here, and it read, read, it's a great theme, and um, especially what's going on with our horrible administration, and it's a theme about what is home, thinking about immigrants, and how we, where we all came from, and also just thinking about what your home is, the physical idea of home, or the the, the sanctuary idea of home. Your home could be under a freeway, it could be a ranch, it could be, you know, many, many things. So I think it's a good theme, and um, hope anybody here is a writer, think about submitting on, on submittable.com. And thanks. Thank you, Phoebe. It's good to know more about Raven Chronicles. And yes, since 1991, right? So it's been here for a while and it's gonna stay for a while. We're very fortunate to have uh, Raven Chronicles in this area. Our next uh, reader is Anna Belint. Balint, okay. Uh, she's the author of Horse Thief, a collection of fiction that was a, f a, f a finalist for the Pacific Northwest Book Award. She has taught at El Centro de la Raza, Antioch University, and Hugo House. She is a teaching artist with 
Path with Art and Recovery Cafe in Seattle. Please welcome Anna. Thank you. I just wanted to add that the people at Recovery Cafe and that are in the book are all people in recovery from might be addiction, might be mental illness, might be trauma, might be a combination of all those. And it's a really wonderful experience for me working with that population. I've worked with all ages and been in prisons and worked with refugee kids. This is adults whose lives were sort of pretty much kicked to the curb and a lot of them had given up on themselves at some point. And the process of how creating aids their recovery, and the incredible stories that come forth is really exciting. And some of that's in the book, which was fun to do. Tonight, I, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a jack of all trades. I write poetry, I write essays, I write fiction, and now I'm doing some editing. And of course I teach. But uh, my poetry is kind of fallen by the wayside quite a bit over the last few years. So I'm sort of coming back to it. And this, this, before even the theme of home came from Raven Chronicles, the theme of home and travel, immigration, refugees, it's been sort of like a ripple, a constant through my life. My first friend was, we had a Sikh family that we shared the house with when I was two years old, where I got introduced to curry and a different culture, and that, that was my first friend, this little Sikh girl. And I'm an immigrant. And I have roots in, a lot of roots in Eastern Europe. I came to this country on my own with a one-way ticket and $100 and plans to stay a year. That was in 1971, and I'm still here. But that whole theme of, of travel, like where do people come from? I used to see growing up huge numbers of people coming. You go to, to the airport, because my brothers like to see the planes come in to land. And I'd be watching the people get off the planes people coming from India, Pakistan, Nigeria, different places, and it's like, why do they want to come here? It's cold, <laughs> it's rainy, and sort of like discovering why people come, why my grandfather came, and why my family now is scattered over three or four continents. So. The whole thing about refugees and what's happening now and the biggest movement of people since the end of World War II, combined with the neighborhood I live in, which is in South Seattle, people across the street are refugees from Laos. The people next door are from Ethiopia. People in the back are Chinese. And all around, many, 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 many families are Somali and more recent. Anyway, all this sort of brewed inside me and came out with this, which is not even really finished. So it's an experiment tonight, so bear with me, okay? I've called it Journeys, and I need my glasses. 